again to uh, the book of <coughs> Revelation chapter 3. While you do that, let me make mention of something I should have made more clear this morning. Our meeting does begin, Lord willing, uh, this uh, Sunday coming up next, uh, next week, Sunday evening. Uh, somebody asked me uh, about what the arrangement would be, and what we've decided to do is just, of course, have our regular Sunday morning service. We'll have our regular classes. So that'll be a little different. Normally in a meeting, the uh, meeting fellow will handle that, but this particular time, our meeting won't start till Sunday night, so we'll be able to have our regular classes Sunday. Of course, Wednesday, we'll have the meeting. But uh, we do want to make clear what we plan to do and let the teachers know how to adjust accordingly. Also, let me make mention of the fact that I do have here uh, a list up for uh, the song leaders for Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. They're assigned, I suppose, Sunday night and Wednesday night. And also for a meal list, Monday through Friday. So I plan to put that on the back board, and I'd love it if we could uh, be able to get this resolved and sorted out uh, by uh, this Wednesday. So if you would put some thought into that, and I'll uh, make sure that we get that up on the back of the board uh, before we leave tonight. All right, <clears throat> Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. We find these words under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee, to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with the eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. We began this morning a study of the subject of, of what it means to be a lukewarm Christian. This was a suggested topic. And uh, let me again add that I do appreciate the suggestions. We have a little box in the back there. We have some cards. If you have a question, if you have something, a subject that you believe would be useful, I do appreciate those suggestions. I've been here a long time. I think one of the responsibilities you have as a teacher is trying to select material that is true, scriptural, useful, and, uh, and it really is helpful to me <clears throat> when brethren say, this is on our mind, this is something we're struggling with, or this is a question we feel we'd like to hear more about. So I do appreciate that, and I invite you to uh, take advantage of that opportunity if you would. But in looking at our text, one of the things we mentioned this morning is it's a terrible thing to be claiming fellowship with God and to be lukewarm. <clears throat> and uh, the idea is that Jesus said, I, I, I just can't stand you. I got folks that claim to belong to me, but I tell you, I'm ready to spit them out. They're so disgusting to me. They're nauseating to me. And that's a very strong language. It would be a horrible thing to think that this congregation, uh, the Lord would look at North Bib and say, I just, I'm ready to spit those folks out. That, that church is lukewarm. The thing, though, that, that is striking, too, is that it's obvious the church at Laodicea did not know they were in that shape. Uh, they, they thought, we're doing fine. <laughs> Everything's here above average. We're doing great. He said, you don't know that in my sight you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So that gets my attention. <clears throat> oh, this is not my problem. Well, they didn't think it was their problem either, but there it was. It may not be your problem, but it's certainly a danger for some folks and it's good for us to think about whether or not we are the ones who are being uh, indeed uh, identified by this kind of, of moniker. So what does lukewarmness look like? We tried to introduce that subject this morning. We talked a little bit about some of the things that, that might be on a list 
uh, of those who are lukewarm. Just a general indifference about spiritual things. They are different about everything. But they, they really can't work. You can't work up a spiritual conversation with some people. I mean, it's just, they just, it's like pulling teeth, trying to talk about God or the Bible or, you know, it just, they just, that's just not their subject. Uh, they, they don't think about heaven. Uh, you know, they're just honest in their daily life. That's just not something that crosses their mind very often unless somebody just happens to bring it up in a lesson. Somebody reads a passage. How do we, we folks who, who make heaven number one in our life, we want to be with God forever and we don't think about it. We don't talk about it. Uh, this is a strange thing. It may be a sign of a deeper problem. Uh, we, we become so distracted by the world. We've got a hundred excuses about why we're not doing all we need to do. <clears throat> and we're going to make those till we die, I reckon. God forbid. Uh, our worship becomes more of just going through the motions. It's not really something that uh, is something we look forward to. It's something we get through. We grit our teeth and get through it. There's something wrong there. And what's wrong there might be related to our subject tonight. I want to pick up there and talk about just a couple of more things. Now, look, as I said, this is a list that I made. You may make a better list than this. I don't think you disagree with the things I put on you. You may have some better suggestions. <clears throat> My throat hadn't gotten any better since this morning. I'm sorry, but you all will bear with me. It won't bother me, and I hope it don't bother you. But let's talk about a few more things that we might say are practical examples of what it means to be uh, lukewarm. I hope I've got this mic up. Normally, I don't have a lot of trouble with folks hearing me, I hope, but I'm trying hard tonight to make sure that I don't wash out here. So here's another example, I think, of things that might fit into that category. Uh, you know, their, their service, our service, is not really a sacrifice. One of the really most impressive passages in the New Testament, the Gospel records, is, is over in Luke chapter 21. We all know this story. And the Lord's there at the temple, and the disciples are there. And there was a certain section there in the court of the women uh, where there were, uh, along the side there, uh, according to ancient sources, uh, and it certainly fits the Bible picture, there were these little trumpet-like uh, containers that people would cast in their, uh, their, their uh, offerings, monetary offerings. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so the, the, Jesus and the disciples are over there, and uh, they're watching these people go by and make a contribution. So uh, chapter 21 of Luke begins, He looked up, and he saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he also saw a certain poor widow casting into their two mites, a very small amount of money, and he said, of a truth I say to you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have cast, have of their abundance cast into the, the offering of God. But she of her penury, which is an old word for poverty, abject poverty, hath cast in all the living that she had. I have never matched that. You know, this woman's not just generous. She's extraordinarily generous. But, you know, for most people, it, it doesn't even register to give till you hurt. And we, we want to sacrifice without making a sacrifice. There's a great story in the Old Testament. It doesn't outdo this lady. I don't think there's any way to outdo this lady. While nobody else saw her, God saw her. But over in the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 21, there's a story here. And we won't go into all the details of it, but you remember this story. David had, uh, had allowed Satan to move him, and uh, he had brought upon himself and the people the, the anger of God. And so God sent a plague, and the plague was stayed by the mercy of God. An angel with the sword drawn was prevented from going further, and the place where he was, where that uh, act of mercy took place was uh, over a threshing floor owned by a man by the name of Onan. And so David was told to build an altar on that place and offer to God. And so David said to Onan, 
He said uh, to Ornan, I should say. He said, uh, verse 22 of First Chronicles 21. David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar thereunto unto the Lord. And thou shalt grant it me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said to David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meal offering. I give it all. And then verse 24, David the king said to Ornan, he said, no, but I will verily buy it for the full price. And then he explained, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. Or as one of the translations says, I will offer to God and sacrifice what costs me nothing. I thought about that through the years, and I've wondered, how much does my sacrifice cost? We're called on not to offer animals in sacrifice. By the way, when you read through Leviticus, and you read about how the Lord says, now I want you to offer a bull for a sin offering. Uh, if you grew up in the suburbs like me, maybe that doesn't strike you like it should. But those of you who have livestock or who grew up on a farm, let me tell you something, bull ain't cheap. Never has been. There's a big difference in offering a goat and offering a bull. You get into some money when you offer a bull. Here's a sacrifice that is especially costly, but God required it of people. And here's the idea here. David said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of offering to God a sacrifice, which was no sacrifice to me. I, it seems to me that's the kind of sacrifice most folks are looking for. I'd like to offer to God something that costs me as little as possible, as little time, as little money, as little effort, as little worry, quick and easy. That's what I... My thought is that, that really fits in line with this picture of lukewarmness. Somebody who's just looking to get by and does not expect to have to really... It costs them something. I could ask this question, and I ask it of myself. What does being a Christian cost me? What does it cost you? What price you pay in here? I was in a meeting uh, out in Texas here uh, last year. And the fellow that was the preacher there and his wife, I, I won't get into their business. I don't want them to, to talk about things that not, maybe I shouldn't talk about. But I'll just make this point. Uh, he, he had a son that turned away from the gospel. And it broke their relationship. There was no malice on, on the part of the, of the Christians. But there was a great deal of malice on the part of this man's daughter-in-law that had, I think, helped to lead his son away. And uh, every time that they were with them, that they felt they could be scripturally, they had to walk on eggshells. It was a very hard thing. You know how they could have fixed that? They could have just surrendered everything Jesus said and just gone along. But because they were people of principle, you know, they weren't going to renounce what they believed to be true. And it really cost them a normal relationship with their, with their only son. Now, that's just an example that comes to mind. I meet folks like that. And I think, you know, it, it costs those folks something to serve God every day. It costs them a relationship with their family. It may cost other people a marriage. It may cost other people a relationship. It may cost a job. It may cost a career. What does it cost me to be a Christian? And if it does cost me something, do I feel like that's just too much? It's a humbling question to me. I think that the, the lukewarm mind is looking to sacrifice what's not a sacrifice. Something else it seems to me might be on this list if we're trying to define in real terms what it means to be lukewarm. It's the kind of person who hears the Word of God without any real intention of change or of doing. How many times have I read that passage in, in James 1? We can just about quote it, can't we? 
You know, James writes this letter. It's a great, short, great letter. One of the earliest, maybe the earliest of all the New Testament epistles that have been preserved for us. And James writes to these, I think, Jewish Christians in, in exile and isolation scattered abroad. And he's writing to them to hold on to what they know is right. And as a, it's a marvelous, practical, uh, you know, heart-touching letter. So <clears throat> in um, uh, chapter 1 and verse 18... We are begotten with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Here are the early Christians and we're going to set the tone for the rest of them. We're the first ones called and it's our job to show the way. Okay. And now right on the heels of that reminder here's what you find. Beloved, let every man be swift to hear Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Verse 21, lay apart all filthiness. And then the last part of the verse, receive. Lay something aside and receive something else. What do you receive? With meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. It's the word, the word, the word. It's the lifeline, it's the message, it's what must be received. Now, in verse 22, he gives that familiar exhortation. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves. You know why he tells me that? Because that's a problem. There are people who think because I listen and I know what's right, that's enough. It's not enough. It's, it, it really makes me worse off. The guy that doesn't know what's right is in some ways closer to God than a fellow like me who's heard it but does not change. So James pleads, the Holy Spirit through James pleads with us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then he gives that, that unforgettable image here of the word as a mirror. He says, you know, if, if, if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass in a mirror, as we would say. And he, he beholds himself and he goes his way. He forgets what needs to be corrected. How is he better off? He's worse off in some ways than he was before. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, you know, he allows it to change him. He submits to its change. He's not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deeds. The question is, we come together and we're so blessed to do it and we hear God's word read by whoever might be teaching. But am I listening with the idea in mind, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to let the word of God help shape me, help improve me. There are things I can do better and I'm going to do better, not just to hear. There's a passage in, in John 7 that I think I, I really, I didn't notice this point for a while. Although it's, it's rather straightforward. <clears throat> The Jews are amazed that Jesus can teach the things he's teaching. How did he get so smart? He can go to school. How does he learn all this? And, and, and the Lord, the incarnate Son of God says, I'm just teaching what my Father gave me. And then he said in verse 17, he said, if any man wants to know his will, he will know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. If you happen to be following with me, you'll notice I didn't read that right. That's not what he said. He didn't say, if any man wants to know his doctrine, he'll know it. I'm not asking you to answer out, but what did he really say? He said, if any man wills to do his will. Isn't that, is that different? It's more than a man saying, I want to know. Jesus said, the man who will find it is the man who wants to do it. And I think that's a, that's a big difference. That guy can't be lukewarm because he's just eaten up with the desire to change, to be better, to be stronger. I don't want to be on the periphery, on the edge. I don't want to be just an also. I want to be as useful to the Lord as I can be. 
And that picture, again, in Luke 18 that we've all read so many times of the publican and the Pharisee. Two men went to the temple to pray. But I think only one of those two men went to the temple to pray to get closer to God. One of them was too busy bragging on himself. And the other one said, Lord, be merciful to me. Oh, there's a huge difference in those two things. More could be said about that. Let me hurry on. we got to get through. But uh, I think there's also uh, a way in which we can make a connection between that lukewarm, tepid kind of attitude and, and being disconnected from the people of God. You know, having been a Christian for several years now, and having met a lot of different people. You know, different people have different personalities. I've met some good people that were not naturally people people. Does that make sense? You know, some people are not people persons. Some people are naturally introverted. Uh, and some people find it a great effort to, to be in, in public and to be in crowds, and they tend to have more... Uh, appreciation for solitude and so on. I, I've met some good people like that. Maybe you can relate to that. Maybe I can. I, I tell you what I think I would say to somebody like that. I don't think that that means you can't go to heaven. But I would say this. I think we need to push ourselves to be around the right kind of people. You know, to some people that come, you don't have to tell them. They, they, they can't live, it seems like, without a crowd. But for those who find that painful, I think there's a place, we may never be as gregarious and as extroverted as somebody else, nor do we have to be. But I think Christians are people, people. Um, especially when it comes to this image of, of, of being uh, with those of like precious faith, as we sometimes say. That passage in Acts chapter 2 comes to mind. Acts 2 you know, here, here's the, the first gospel sermon preached, and here is the, the uh, outcome of that. They that gladly received his word, verse 41, were baptized. And the same day were added to them about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. All these involve collective action. Coming together to hear God's word. Sharing spiritually. Taking the supper together. Verse 43 continues in this same vein. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And they that believed were together. And had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. I think you see here both in terms of collective action and in terms of a group of individuals, in terms of worship and in terms of, of just being together. Here were people who just couldn't seem to get enough of it. Praising God and having favor with all the people. The old King James says, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The point is, I'll tell you why these folks who came from all over the place were so uh, obsessed with each other's company because they shared together the most important thing. Now, I guess what I'm talking about in this is not so much shy people. I don't think shyness is a sin. I think it's something that we need to work to get out of our comfort zone, as we say, and, and, and to make time. We, we'll, we'll be a blessing to other people, and we'll be blessed by being around those of like precious faith. But I'm more talking about the spirit. <coughs> it may not be shyness at all. It's just we don't, we don't seem to have that connection. In fact, truth is, we feel a little bit stifled when we're around all these religious people. And we, we really don't share in the kind of zeal they seem to have. Now, I, I think that's a warning sign for us. You know, in Hebrews chapter 10, you know, there's a little picture here again of these 
Hebrew Christians who were facing their own dangers and trials and the Hebrew writers pleading with them to, to draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith having their hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and their bodies washed with pure water. And as we're drawing together to God, we're going to be drawing with one another. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he's faithful and promised. Let us consider one another to provoke to love and good works. We're looking to stimulate and provoke each other. You and I have seen this through the years if we've been around for any length of time. You know, you have a body, a congregation of God's people, and they can be so very different in some ways, different backgrounds, different interests, but they share the gospel. And, and, and as they grow to be friends and people appreciate one another, it is such a blessing. But sometimes I may just feel like I'm the odd man out here. I don't really share what these other folks see. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. You know, if what bothers me is just is just too much religiousness, this is a problem. And this is a sign that I, my heart's not where it needs to be. It can result in what James warned about in James chapter 3. <clears throat> you know, James 3, he's talking about the tongue, and this is a great um, warning for, for any man. The tongue can no man tame, he says in verse 8. No man, no man can tame it. I don't think that means that you can't control your tongue in some sense. He's, he's pleading with us to control it. But he's saying you never will tame it. You know, you know when uh, you see on the news, this is not an exact parallel, but it's close. And uh, somebody, some very unwise person has decided, you know what I need? I need to get a pet mountain lion. Now this is what I've been lacking in my life. And so they do. And, uh, and it goes along for a while, and then all of a sudden one day it just uh, gobbles up their kids and eats uh, both their arms off. And, and you say, well, what happened there? You know what happened? That, that animal you were trying to tame ain't going to be tamed. You can control it for a little while, but you ain't going to tame it. You, if you turn your back on it, uh, its wildness will come out. I think that's the point that the, the writer's making here. I don't think he's trying to discourage us. He's just saying, understand you will never be able to turn your back on, the t on, on your, your need to control your speech because it'll always be a threat. So then verse 9, he says, therewith, with the tongue, bless we God, even the Father. Therewith, curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. What's, what's wrong with this picture? What's right with this picture? You're going to use the same tongue to bless God and then curse your fellow man. He said, out of the same mouth proceed blessings and cursings. These things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain bring forth in the same place sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? It just doesn't work that way. Now, what you, what, what's the image here? What's the picture here? I don't think they're cursing men in the assembly. I think the idea is I'm over here in the assembly and it's bless God and then I go over here in some other company and it's cursed man. And he said, let me tell you, that's hypocrisy and it's wrong. Another picture, another image, I think, of the lukewarm individual is someone is different with different crowds. Uh, I don't really care to be around those church people so much they sort of stifle my fun. But I feel a lot more comfortable over here somewhere. But that kind of two-faced attitude is the very kind of problem that goes along with this, uh, this, this terrible sin. One more I mention here is a lack of, of spiritual appetite. The passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we've read through the years, you know, he, he calls on us to lay aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, and as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We got young, we got parents in here, young children. We've all been through that. Our children are older. We remember those days. And uh, let me tell you, kids can be pretty insistent about needing to eat something, and they don't care what time it is. They know they need something. And he's not talking here about, I, I think. 
exclusively young Christians. That's not his point. He's saying every Christian needs to have the same appetite for God's word that a newborn babe has. So he's not just saying here, newborn babes need the word. Everybody, every one of us needs the word. Um, you know, we, we've just begun the new year, calendar year, and it's a time when people get involved in their Bible reading. I'll ask you again, how you doing with that? Don't answer out, but just think about that. Have you, have you gotten sidetracked yet? Well, if you have, then just make it up today. Get, get, get with it today. Get back on track today. I was talking with, a, with a, a member here just a few days ago, and they were talking to me about something that I think all of us have experienced. They said, you know, I've made a determination, turn off the news, get away from the noise, and to spend more time just letting God speak to me, reading his word, he said, I feel like it has helped me so much in my mind, in my spirit. I know exactly what he's talking about. But I'm saying if, if, we, just, if we just have decided that's not for us and we're continuing down the same old path, we're getting the same old results, that may be a heavy contribution to an attitude that is less than zealous for God. You got to let God talk to you, and you got to talk to God. That's Colossians chapter 4. We got to pray continuously, pray constantly, pray regularly. To speak to God and let God speak to us. This is a critical part, it seems to me, of the process. And when it's not there, I, I don't think we can help but, but wander off into something much more like what was going on at Laodicea all those years ago. All right, the last few minutes of the lesson, I want to deal with two other quick questions. I wanted to, to say, having maybe some more idea specifically about what lukewarmness looks like, why is it that people fall into such places? Why is that a temptation to me? I don't know all the answers. Maybe sometimes it's because I just don't really feel a personal responsibility and connection. I think about God, and I think about the world, and I think about the church, but one thing that I must never forget is that God calls me. I wish I had time. Uh, I, I thought about a series of passages, and these are not the ones I was thinking about, that, <clears throat> that just make that personal connection between God calling us, not his people, but us. I do know in Acts 2.38 that the message of Peter, you remember it, was repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sin. Every Christian in this room became a Christian individually. There's work for us to do collectively. There's an important part we have as a whole. Let me tell you, ultimately, we have a connection with God individually. We love God with our heart, soul, and mind, or we don't have a relationship with him. This is not a crowd thing. And sometimes I can forget that God has expectations, not just for the church, but for me as a part of his people. I don't know how I can forget that because the Lord seems to be reminding me of it so many times. Let's just use one in Romans chapter 12. A great passage calling on us to be this living sacrifice. Be not conformed to the world. Be transformed by the real of your mind. You could, just, you could just think all day about the ways in which that applies to us. But look at verse 3. The next thing he, say, he writes is, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you. This is an individual message. First of all, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having, he says then, gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, that's just a word for service, then let us wait on our ministry, or teaching, he that teacheth on teaching. I don't see in this just a list of, of miraculous gifts. 
I think the things he's talking about here, many of them relate to just everyday, non-miraculous. He's saying you have the gift, you have the ability, you have the opportunity, then get busy serving me. And and I I think because I I forget that, that God's looking right, not at the church at North Bib, right at me. And he knows whether I'm doing it or not. He's asking me, are you doing what you can? Are you growing as you should? Are you serving as you should? What can you do? What are you doing? I'm not in competition with some other brother over here who has abilities I don't have. You know, that's the point. We're a body. Everybody's not the same. Okay, but everybody's got a part. I think one of the reasons why I might fall into that lukewarm, you know, awful attitude is I just have forgotten that God called me for a reason. And he called you for a reason. And I think that's the very point that he's making in this passage. Uh, You know, we don't think God's demanding. We don't think he's a hard master. I don't mean he's unfair. He's never unfair. He's always loving. That passage in Matthew 25, again, how many times have I read this verse? I'm sure you've read it many, many times. And the Lord says, let me tell you, the kingdom of heaven is like a fellow who was going to go off on a journey traveling, and he had money, and so he had three servants, and he gave to each an amount of money. A talent is an amount of money. And one of them, he he gave five talents to one, two, one, one talent, according to their ability. Didn't ask more of them than they could give. He gives them the money. He goes off on this long journey, and guess what? He comes back. And when he comes back, guess what he's looking for? A return. First fellow's not surprised by that. He says, you gave me five, here are five more. Well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, you you, you gave me two talents, here are two more. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. You've been faithful over a few things, I'll make you rule over many. We all remember the last fellow. He, uh, uh, He that had the one talent came, verse 24, and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you had not, uh, not strewed. And I was afraid. And I went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, you have what's yours. And the Lord said, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew, you knew that I reaped where I hadn't sowed. You ought rather to have taken my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take the talent from him. Give it to the fellow that had five talents. Everyone that has should be given. He'll have an abundance. And from him that hath not shall be taken away even what he has. And then verse 30, the terrible words. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you think for a moment, do I think for a moment that I can hide my light under a bushel and God won't notice? Am I that foolish? Again, we're not in competition with each other. That's not what it's about. But every one of us has been given gifts, gifts to develop, gifts to use for his glory. And one of these days, do not doubt it, I'm going to have to give account. And what am I going to say? How pathetic would it be if I said, well, Lord, I'm just afraid. I know that's not going to work. That's already been tried. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe I just don't really appreciate. Maybe I won't let myself understand how demanding God is. Maybe sometimes it's the failure of other people. And again, we don't have time to develop this point, but in Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and Pharisees. There's a lot of false teaching going around, and there's some people who sink to the level of these false teachings. In in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus, an interesting point he made there, he said, I'll tell you, if you're going to serve me, you're going to have to fight your own family. I didn't come to send peace. I came to bring a sword. And I'm telling you that a man will be at variance. He'll be at odds. He'll be in conflict against his father and the daughter against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe should be there of his own household. Don't you suppose the picture here is 
that a man's going to have to choose between following his family and following the Lord sometimes? I'll tell you what the Lord said about it. He didn't bat an eye. He said, I'll tell you, a man that uh, does not put me first not worthy of me. He's not worthy of me. And he that will find his life will lose it, and a man that loses his life for my sake will find it. Maybe it's the failures of those close to me. Maybe it's the failure even of, of great brethren that might lead me into some sort of a, a lulling uh, to sleep less than a zealous spirit. Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Sometimes it's just simply because our treasure is somewhere else. You know the story in Luke chapter 12 of the man who um, uh, had uh, determined that his life's work was tearing down barns so he could build greater and he could retire early and he could have all the fruits of his labor. You remember the Lord told that story. But do you remember why he told that story? Here he is in, in, in Luke 12 and he's teaching lessons about high and holy things. He's talking about offering your life for God. He's talking about uh, <clears throat> never denying the Lord before this world. Uh, he, he's talking here about the persecution and trial that would come uh, on those who would hold to him. And in the midst of that, it seems, somebody puts their hand up and says, Lord, you're going to have to straighten out our inheritance here. I, my brother, he's not giving me all that belongs to me. I'm talking about these things, and that's what you think is your big problem? And that's when he told the story about the man who wanted to tear down his barns and build greater. And the, and the, and the point that he drew there was, so is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And in that same context, if you keep reading in Luke 12, same lesson. The Lord said, Seek first, verse 31, the kingdom of God and all these things should be added to you. He said, Sell what you have. Give alms. Provide yourselves bags that wax not old. Where your treasure is, verse 34, there will your heart be also. All these things, it seemed to me, make it clear. The Lord said, You just got to really decide what's important to you. A lot of things we're called on to do. Hey, if, if you're a man, you've got to take care of your family. That's true. You have to provide for them. That's true. We're called on to, and I don't think we're wrong to enjoy this life. There's things we enjoy in this life. But what's number one with you? What matters more than anything else? And the Lord said, if it's not me, then, then your life is totally misguided. Point is that sometimes I think that may be the problem. It's just simply we don't have God on the throne. That we love this world and not and the things of this world. Let me, with the last couple of minutes, deal with one more question. And that is this: how do we rekindle the fire? If we feel like that, that maybe our, our fire is lower than it should be, you know, that, what can I do? What can I do? Well, I, I think if I might go back to Revelation 3, where we started. I think the Lord gives us a few hints about how to get back for the Laodiceans to get back to where they were uh, at one point. I think he's offering them hope. The first thing he remember told them was, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation. I find it interesting. What he first thing he does is calls them to understand who it is that's speaking, who calls them, the amen, be it so, it is sure, uh, the faithful, the true. Uh, these are things that are solid in a world <clears throat> that is filled with shifting sand. There's some things that are solid. It's interesting how when, when people follow this world and its morality, you know, they, they're going to be chasing their tail their whole life because men change their mind and, and, uh, and, and fashions change and men's opinions change. What God wants us to do is stand on something that's solid that comes from he that is the beginning of the creation. That doesn't mean Jesus was the first created being but it means that all creation comes from him. Colossians chapter 1 by him were all things through him are all things 
He is before all things. By him all things consist. What's the point? The point is that Jesus as the creator has the right to command us. You know, these, these folks on television or these movie stars, they, they don't have any right to do anything. They have loud bows and arrogant attitudes, but they're not the creator. He says, remember who's talking to you. Get in line with the one who made you and made all things. And so that's the first thing I can do is to give God his place. The second thing he calls on me to do, back in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, he said, I want you to buy of me gold. I think I read that several times before. I, what is the, what's the point of that? Gold is valuable. Well, it is valuable. That's absolutely true. There are other things that are valuable. One unique aspect of gold as a metal, gold is virtually indestructible. One fellow said it will not corrode, it will not rust, it will not tarnish. <coughs> you can't destroy it by fire. What's Jesus saying when he says, I want you to buy of me gold? I think he's saying, I want you to take from me the thing that will last. You know, this world and all of its fashions and all of its ideas, they'll all go down the drain ultimately. But this is something that will not corrupt. Isn't that the point that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 6? Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust are corrupt. But thieves do not break through and steal. For your treasure is, there will your heart be also. As I said a moment ago, and you know it's true, we live in this world and there are a lot of things we do that are related to this world. But I tell you, if I look at my life and I think that my only treasure is what little I got in the bank, what I got in the garage, what I got in the closet or wherever. You know, if that's what it is, then I am a poor man indeed. Jesus said, I want you to buy of me something that you won't lose, you can't lose, something that is eternal in its nature. Seek white raiment, he says back in our text in Revelation 3. Seek white raiment, raiment that will cover the shame of your nakedness. I, I think the image we're there is of that which is pure, morally pure. If you want to, to shake yourselves out of some doldrums, commit yourself to sanctification and purity. Ephesians chapter 4 has such a great lesson on that. He said, you, you live in the world, you know how the Gentiles think, but you've been called by Christ to make up your mind to live by a higher standard. You know, our jokes are not their jokes. Our, our entertainment is not their entertainment. Our goals are not their goals. Our language is not their language. When I'm committed to purity, I, I'm just not going to be satisfied with that lukewarm halfway attitude. And he says, I, I want you to take of me I, Sam. I got a text today uh, from uh, a brother who had been listening in on, uh, online, and he was talking about Laodicea and some of the unique aspects of that city. And, uh, and, and there are some unique things here. And I think when he brings up the I, Sam, uh, it's another aspect of this, that uh, there was, I'm told, a, 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 in that very area, a, a so-called Phrygian powder that was used for eye diseases throughout the ancient world. And so when he brings up buying eye salve, it has a special resonance for that area. But I think what he's really talking about is, is, is the point that's made so many times in the scriptures that if you're going to serve God, you've got to be able to see what's real. You know, when Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, and I, again, we'll not take the time to, to develop all of these passages, but I encourage you to take them on and read them. One example, Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, the light of the body is the eye. If the eye is single, thy whole body shall be full of light. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And if the light that is in thee is darkness, how great is that darkness? What does he mean by that? If your eye is single, well, I think we know what double vision is. You know, if somebody sees double, he's not going to make it very well. Uh, he'd probably be able to lift his head up. If you've ever seen people who are afflicted with, uh, uh, with, with uh, double vision, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a very unpleasant experience. But there are people spiritually, and their eyes are not focused, and they're looking at things that really don't matter, and they're making the world out of things 
that are temporary. And the point he makes here is, if that's what passes for light, then, uh, then you're in bad shape indeed. And that lesson is taught over and over and over again. You're going to have to see what's real. The things that we see with our physical eye are temporary, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4. But the things that we see with the spiritual eye are eternal. One more point. If you go back one more time to Revelation 3, how is it, what do I need to do to, to get from where I am in more of a lukewarm, less than zealous place to the place where God would have me to be? I tell you, ultimately we're going to have to open the door. This figure, we've all seen the picture that was painted. I don't know who painted it. But it's been reproduced many, many times of Jesus knocking at the door. You've seen that. When, it looks like Jesus needs a haircut, most of them I've seen. But anyway, Jesus knocking at the door, you know. Uh, well, that comes from this passage. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Verse 20. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. So many times when I have seen that image, it's been in the context of Jesus offering himself to the world saying, come to me. Well, I'm sure he does want the world to come to him. But you know, that's not the context here, is it? He's talking to his own children. But they're children who are wayward. He's talking to the church at Laodicea and saying, you need to come to me. You need to open the door. I'm here. <clears throat> But you've got to let me in. He's not going to break the door down. He will not force us. What is the point he makes? What's the word he uses in this passage? Repent. So if I'm here and any of what we've talked about tonight sounds too familiar, and if I see myself tonight as not being on fire for God as I know I should be, then I've got to make this decision. Am I going to walk away from the mirror and forget what he's told me? Or am I going to make the changes necessary? Am I going to open the door and let the Lord come in and help me change? Or am I going to just let him stand out there and knock? That's a very, I think, important question. I appreciate the kind way that you've listened today. appreciate the suggestion of the topic. It's been good for me, frankly, to think about these things and to think about changes that I need to make. And if you uh, uh, find that same thing, I hope we all make wise decisions with God's help. Haven't already, please take your songbook out. Turn to the number that's been selected. If you desire tonight to respond to God's call, to be baptized into Christ or as a child of God, to uh, return to Him if you've strayed from Him, we'd be glad to help you. As we stand and sing, hope you'll let us know how we might do that now. <clears throat>